submarines, massive machines that operate in the most hostile conditions on the planet. A world with no light, no air, and crushing pressures. Inner space. But there's one massive advantage to being underwater that has driven the development of submarines. And that is you can hide something this big anywhere in the world and no one can find you. The underwater world, an amazing place to be if you don't want to be seen. And a couple of hundred years ago, people realized there might be a military use for the concealing powers of water. In 1776, American revolutionary David Bushnell came up with a devious plan to defeat the British. Crazy as it seems, Bushnell's idea was to sneak up on the British flagship in New York Harbor, concealed underwater, and blow it up in an oversized wooden barrel. And this is a replica of the machine he came up with. But it's not just any old barrel. Bushnell's turtle was man-powered and submersible. It was the first submarine. And for its day, it was an incredibly advanced machine. It had controls to go every which way. It even had a depth gauge. And Bushnell was also smart enough to persuade someone else to drive it, a young soldier called Ezra Lee. Ezra had a rudder to steer and used foot pedals to drive a propeller, <laughs> allowing him to move towards his target at a sedate two knots. Just before dawn, he submerged and pedaled his barrel right under the flagship. And then, the main business. On the back of the turtle was a wooden bomb containing 70 kilograms of gunpowder attached by a rope to a screw on top of the turtle, which Ezra planned to attach to the ship's hull using another crank. But, unfortunately, he managed to position the turtle underneath an impenetrable part of the hull and couldn't get the screw to bite. Exhausted and running out of air, he surfaced, was spotted by the British and only narrowly escaped. Although a failure, the turtle had demonstrated the sneaky, stealthy potential for submarine warfare. He must have been fit. It also demonstrated that a submarine on the surface is also the proverbial sitting duck. Sad but true, I'm afraid, Daffy. <laughs> To become a more lethal weapon, the submarine would need to stay hidden underwater for much longer. But the turtle did establish the basic principles used by all subsequent submarines. This two-man mini-sub is its direct descendant. But thanks to batteries and life support systems, this sub can stay submerged for up to eight hours to search for wrecks or simply poke around this picturesque West Country quarry. She's built to explore the submarine world, not mooch around up here. Come on, dive, dive, dive! Welcome to inner space. It's pretty weird down here, and even in a modern sub like this, quite scary. We're landing down the ground. Oh, it's on silt. I'm suddenly finding I don't like being a submarine here. Thankfully, submarines are as good at going back up as they are at going down. The secret is a brilliantly simple device known as the ballast tank, as used on all submarines. Here's one I made earlier. There we are, our model submarine. Each of the ballast tanks has permanently open holes along the bottom and vents on the top, controlled by me removing these blobs of blue tack. Now to submerge, what I do is I remove the blue tack, air escapes, allowing water to flow into the tanks, and the submarine starts to submerge. Once you reach the desired depth, you close the vents to stop the descent and hover. Now, surfacing is simply a matter of getting air into the tanks. 
and the submarine returns to the surface. Simple. Bushnell's turtle had astonishingly cracked the main principles, but it would be another 125 years before the technology was available to build the first truly practical submarine. And this is it, the Holland One, the Royal Navy's first submarine, launched in 1901 with a crew of seven unwashed sailors, to quote the Admiral of the Fleet. Ironically, it had been designed by Irish émigré John Holland with the destruction of the Royal Navy in mind. The Admiralty saw submarine warfare as underwater, underhand and damned un-English, but bought five of the things all the same. The Holland One rocked along at nearly eight knots on the surface, thanks to this 160 horsepower petrol engine. That's a whole lot of power for a hundred years ago, but it wasn't much use once submerged. If you left your engine running underwater for more than a few seconds, you'd use up all the oxygen in your watertight container, choking your crew in the process, which is pretty bad news. But Holland had come up with a solution. Like the mini-sub, Holland 1 ran on electric power when submerged. And Holland had worked out how to keep his batteries topped up between missions. The clever part is that on the surface, with plenty of oxygen available, the petrol engine not only drove the propeller, but it also rotated the electric motor backwards, turning it into a generator which charged the batteries. And that's the way submarines would be powered for the next 50 years. On a full charge, the Holland One could submerge for nearly four hours. It was also designed to withstand the massive increase in pressure of deep water. To demonstrate, take a simple, non-reinforced cylindrical hull, descend, and water pressure soon starts to deform that hull. Not a good idea. Making your hull much thicker would add too much weight. So Holland employed a very simple device. Reinforcing rings, or as they're known in the trade, frames. They act to strengthen the hull. Without them, it would be crushed like a giant tin can. If we take a similar hull and reinforce with stiffeners, just like in the Holland. There we are, there we have a similar hull with stiffeners and frames. Let's try again. Descend. Ah! We have integrity. Top stiffeners. The Holland could dive to 20 meters, making it pretty stealthy. But its most important innovation was its ability to attack without having to surface. Thanks to this clever little device, Enter the periscope. This gave you a great tactical advantage. You could see ships, but ships couldn't see you. Delightfully underhand. And the perfect way to target the submarine's most notorious weapon, the torpedo. Torpedo in the water. 1,000 feet to target. One second to impact. The torpedo allows a submerged submarine to attack from a distance and turn and run before the enemy has a chance to fire back. The perfect weapon for a stealth attack. To fire, you would crank open the torpedo hatch at the front, flooding the tube. Compressed air would then be blasted into the tube, forcing the torpedo out into the water. It would then run under its own compressed air for 300 yards until, hopefully, it struck home. The Holland One convinced the British Admiralty that submarines were a valuable weapon. But this machine was limited to harbour operations only. The low conning tower put it at real risk from flooding in anything but dead calm conditions. And that's exactly what happened to this submarine. Whilst being towed to a scrappy in 1913, she was swamped and sank in Plymouth Sound, where she lay undisturbed for 70 years. Which is lucky for us, because otherwise, she would have been melted down to make razor blades. From now on, conning towers would become bigger, much bigger. In fact, massive. 
It was time submarines grew up and went to sea. During World War I, the submarine came of age, sinking an incredible 11 million tons of shipping. That's a quarter of all the world's total tonnage. In World War II, the German Navy built nearly 1,200 U-boats, more than 90% of their entire navy, wreaking havoc on Atlantic convoys. To fight long campaigns at sea, these submarines needed more weapons and more men. They had to get much bigger, and they did. As you can probably tell from the 1,400-ton HMS Alliance diesel-electric long-range patrol submarine behind me. Built in 1945 with a range of 10,000 miles and a crew of 68, she was designed for missions that would keep her at sea for weeks. And inside, submarines had got a lot more complicated. What a place to work. There's levers and controls and dials and switches and everything everywhere. What switch? There's millions of them, for goodness sake. Go away. The Alliance would be crammed with 16 torpedoes. Weapon storage had priority over living conditions. And wherever there was a bit of extra space, you'd find bunks. But not enough bunks for everyone. So you would hot bunk, meaning that as soon as you jumped out of bed, there was someone else waiting to jump in for his turn. Lovely. Spending most of the time on the surface, you needed some pretty powerful engines. How about two Vickers eight-cylinder supercharged diesels, each rated at 2,150 horsepower? Look at that, absolutely massive cylinders, about half a metre across. Even the spanners are massive. And like all of her predecessors, she runs on electric motors when submerged. Being huge, she needs a fair amount of electrical power to drive them. 112 tons of batteries stored beneath the floor, to be precise. That's 224 half-ton cells in two banks. That's five and a half million AA batteries. A lot, but incredibly, they only lasted 20 minutes at full speed. So you had to spend most of your time on the surface. And that meant the submarine was vulnerable. Sitting ducks to long-range aircraft fitted with radar. If spotted, you needed to crash dive. Trim hydroplane to dive. Open vents to flood forward ballast tanks. Get crew forward to help drive nose down. Shut off the diesels. Seal the hatches. Engage electric motors at full speed and go deep. Then, before you use up your batteries, cut your motors. I'll bust it. Go silent and wait. All in less than a minute. There was nothing left to do but sit motionless in the depths, hoping that your pursuers would lose the trail. But anti-submarine ships now had sonar, the ability to bounce sound off you underwater to see where you were. And once they'd found you, they would circle above, dropping depth charges. <coughs> depth charges are quite simply canisters full of explosives. Dropped or launched off the stern of a ship, they sink and detonate at a preset depth. The explosion sends out a blast of pressure waves, so even if the bomb doesn't touch it, the submarine's hull could be ruptured. With limited battery supplies, these subs just couldn't run from the increasing threat posed by depth charges. They just had to sit it out and hope for the best. It must have been terrifying. This floor turned the tide against submarines. During the war, more than 1,000 submarines were sunk with a loss of nearly 40,000 men. This generation of subs had run its course. What was needed was a revolutionary new power source that would enable the submarine to run for much longer periods underwater, to effectively become independent of the surface. In 
1954, the USS Nautilus became the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. It could stay submerged almost indefinitely, and nuclear-powered, nuclear-armed submarines quickly became the most important technology of the Cold War. Just one kilogram of uranium, that's that much, releases the same energy as two and a half thousand tons of coal. That's getting on for twice the weight of that submarine. That is one substantial weight saving. Not to mention the space. Oh, and of course, no stokers required. To prove that this revolutionary new technology would transform the submarine's capabilities, in 1958, with her crew of 116 men, USS Nautilus journeyed under the polar ice beneath the North Pole, something no submarine before it could ever have achieved. For the Cold War superpowers, the submarine had become the perfect nuclear missile platform. You could hide dozens of intercontinental ballistic missiles under the sea, anywhere around the globe, without being detected. But these missiles are huge, so the machine that carries them has to be pretty big too. In fact, it has to be massive. HMS Vigilant is one of Britain's four nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines, or bombers, as they're called, and she is truly enormous. She's 150 metres long and weighs in at an immense 16,000 tonnes. With four decks, more electronics than the space shuttle and no windows, the Vigilant is one serious piece of kit. So just how do you hide something this big? The entire submarine is covered with these tiles. But they're not just any old tiles, they're what's known as anechoic tiles, which basically means they absorb sound. So, no use trying to find Vigilant using sonar. And inside the submarine, every piece of equipment, from the power plant to door latches, is designed to operate as quietly as possible. But the real key to this submarine's stealth is its ability to remain submerged for literally months at a time. And it can do that by providing its 134 crew with a life support system fit for a spacecraft. Behind this door is the key to everything. I'm not actually going back there because it's classified. The rear of the boat is in fact off limits to me. But what I can tell you is that back there is a very powerful nuclear reactor, which incidentally is about the size of a dustbin. Thanks to the massive amount of power available from the nuclear reactor, nuclear submarines can use electricity to generate oxygen from water. These are the sub's gills. Oxygen is generated by a process known as electrolysis. Water is pumped into these machines, the electrolyzers. Electric current is passed through the water. The resulting oxygen is collected and hydrogen is pumped out to sea. Ah, one of my favorite school experiments. One battery, some wire and two pencils to be your electrodes. Now the positive electrode, the yellow pencil, is producing oxygen. You can just see on the negative electrode, the hydrogen is producing twice as many bubbles as we have oxygen. Collect the gas from the positive electrode, and hey presto, you've got yourself some oxygen. HMS Vigilance electrolyzers do exactly the same thing on a massive scale. Another of life's essentials is water. A submarine is surrounded by it. But you can't drink it. It's a bit salty. Again, with a powerful nuclear reactor at your disposal, the solution is simple. As this salt water boils, the steam produced condenses and produces fresh water. I will condense it and let the fresh water drop into that glass. Look at that. Right. Let's see uh, what kind of water we've produced. Should be fresh water. Not a great deal of water produced, but um, I think you know what I mean. I'm tasting that water, not a trace of salt in it. Absolutely superb experiment. So power is the key to limitless life support. 
fact, running out of food is the only limiting factor on how long this submarine can stay submerged. Otherwise, this machine could circumnavigate the globe for years without surfacing. Nuclear power brings speed too. HMS Vigilant can manage an impressive 25 knots when submerged, as fast as any enemy ship, and streets ahead of her diesel-electric predecessors. At that speed, you need some pretty hefty control services. I could actually park my Land Rover on one of those. But running away is the last resort. Secrecy is the preferred defense. When HMS Vigilant is on patrol, only the captain, executive officer and navigator know where the submarine is really going. The ship's crew are kept on a strictly need-to-know basis. Diving now, diving now. Open four, five and six main vents. Open four, five and six. Once the order to dive is given, the submarine won't be seen for months. She could be in any ocean on the planet, with no sign of her presence. This is the navigator's position, and I'm doing something which is rather top secret and navigatorial, so shoo. These submarine crews take their mission to remain hidden very seriously. They are the guardians of a deadly arsenal of massive Trident missiles. Each is 13 meters high and carries warheads capable of wiping out an entire city. These missiles have to be maintained around the clock, ready to fire. This submarine exists for only one reason, to maintain global peace, and that's a deadly serious job. Although no one would ever want to do it, when at sea, every member of the crew has to be prepared for a launch command, to press the button, to launch the missiles she carries. And that's the reason why this submarine has to remain hidden day in and day out. Nuclear submarines are the first true submarines. Massive underwater machines, truly independent of the surface. The perfect stealth weapon. <laughs>